welcome everybody to Who's Your Band? Uh, I am Jeffrey Paul. I am joined today by my co-host, Mr. Sean Morton. How are you, Sean? Well, I'm looking like a grown-up gentleman, unlike you. A grown-up gentleman. This is like, it's, it's, we're in New York, and it is really, this is like one of the hottest days of the summer so far. And God forbid I spent a little time in the pool, and I got out of the pool maybe 45 minutes ago. So this is after pool look. Do you have but, matching uh, bandanas with matching glasses, too? Like, do you have a red <laughs> pair of glasses? You go to the dollar store and buy a red bandana, too? Yeah, I got, I got the bandana, the glasses, and the T-shirt, man. And, you know, going for uh, Brett Michaels' father's look. Yeah, yeah. you got uh, your crocus denim jacket to go along with it, too? That's a great reference, crocus. I wonder if they're going to make our list today. I, I crocus. Doubt I just screaming in the night. Um, speaking of screaming in the night, this guy, our guest uh, joined us today. Man, he had a killer set last night because he is a comedian. He is an actor. You've seen him on a bunch of commercials. It, it was a commercial. I, it was for like a school or something. It was on all the time. Um, joining us, he he's a host of the Week in Sex podcast. Give it up for my buddy, Mr. Alan Fuchs. How are you, Alan? Good, good. How you doing, Jeff? Great set last night, man. You really, really killed it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. Good job, too. What's up, Sean? Thank you. How are you, man? Good. So anyway, we are going to talk uh, a little bit about this. I think this is a, uh, a passionate topic, you know, talking about the best concerts that we've seen. And, you know, people chime in about it and, they, you know, People like they they love talking about the shows they've seen. So let's go. We'll do like a roundtable thing, and then um, uh, we'll we'll read some of the uh, the viewer comments about this. But uh, what makes a great concert? Is it uh, the set list? Is it the stage show? Is it the lineup? This is completely arbitrary. This is completely subjective. So let's start with uh, with, with you, Sean. Um, name like the let's go let's do five we can go a little bit more if you want but let's do five so what which would be your number five concept um do we have to go in order because i'm just going to no. randomly throw out this is impossible this was yeah really i, mean, I, I know what my favorite gonna... concert was of all time but i'm not going to start with that i want to start with the last concert i went to for me it was uh even though it was only last week it really went down as one of the most amazing things i ever saw it was the foo fighters at msg what uh, was it amazing because it was you know, concerts are such a major part of my life. You know, I mean, there was there was a summer when I went to 17 concerts in one summer. So it's a good summer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for, for me, it's about it, it's about getting your friends together. It's about the release. It's about seeing the great music, the great bands, the great set list the venues, all that stuff. And that was kind of taken away from us for during COVID. And I had mm -hmm. seen a show uh, about a month ago. Uh, which was an outdoor show. And it was very cool. It was a great guy that I, I love to watch. Name is uh, Brian Fallon from the Gaslight Anthem. But it was just him and the guitar. So it was a little, it was good to get out to hear music. But we were aching for that, like, one rock or metal show. So I was able to get tickets for the Foo Fighters. I was like, this is going to be great. And it took a, you know, it took a turn with people going with the, I'm not, you know, I'm not vaccinated. So I'm pissed off that I can't go and all this bullshit. And I was like, I don't give a shit. Um, I got vaccinated and I got tickets. So uh, when we went there, it was, uh, I mean, it was wall to wall people. It was 20,000 people. It was completely, completely sold out MSG. And I've seen the Foo Fighters probably a dozen times in concert. They never put on a bad show, but it was just something about that show. It was kind of like the turn, you know, away from COVID, I believe, and, and getting back to normalcy for a lot of people. And they opened up with times like these. So if you know the chorus, it's times like these you learn to live again. I mean, right. there was people crying in the seats. People would just cry. Uh, no, I didn't cry. Um, I, I did. I did try to uh, slightly touch myself a little bit, trying not to uh, bring up too much attention. You know, uh, great set list. They brought out Dave Chappelle to do uh, "Creep" by Radiohead, which was very strange. Um, and they did a, a Bee Gees cover because they have a Bee Gees cover album coming out next month. What was, what was the Bee Gees cover they did? They did uh, You Should Be Dancing. Was it 
did they try and stick to the the original arrangement or did they just change the arrangement? It's up? it's fairly close to the original arrangement and it's really good. Mm. Um, they're doing five BG songs. I think more than a woman that uh, jive talking. Uh, they're doing shadow dancing by uh, Andy, Andy Gibb. Gibb. and uh, five by Barry. Right, and then doing five uh, live versions of some of the new songs on the album. But yeah, for me, it was just like a kind of a, a bringing back to normal moment. Uh, great show. I mean, I can't pinpoint a better Foo Fighters show, which I may, I may do it in my list anyway later on. But uh, yeah, it was great. It was great to be there. I had a bunch of friends there. And uh, there was not one person in there who was not completely losing their mind through the whole show, which was great, too. I saw the set list and it looked like a great show. It was a great set list. Yeah, amazing. They played a lot of new stuff, which they always do, but they played their hits, you know, and they, they played for three hours. So you can't ask for anything more. <laughs> so no show. opener. No opener. Hmm. All right. So that's your number five. Well, we're not going in any particular order. Adam Fuchs. Adam, you... Adam Fuchs? <laughs> what do you call Adam Fuchs? Adam, I'm sorry, buddy. Dope. What a dope. The guy's sitting here like, oh, uh, there's a guy named Adam in this room, too. I have no <laughs> idea because my name is Alan. It's right there. It says on the screen. Maybe if you had, maybe if there were better prescription Waldo glasses, you'd, un- you'd get your name on <laughs> there. It's your friend who you booked on the show who you worked with last night, whose name is Alan Fuchs. I worked with him once five years ago, and I remember his name automatically. You worked with him last night and forgot his name. Continue. Go ahead. Uh, so Andy, what's your pick for... Uh, <laughs> number five pick (laughs) well we're going we're going backwards we're going uh whatever way you want i don't know i i remember uh a concert i saw it was uh pink floyd uh i think it was ages ago the division fell i killed to see that oh sure was that um at yankee stadium so I'm like, yeah, it was, uh, I think it was the Yankee Stadium. Yeah. And it was, uh, I got tickets because I had a, a crush on this girl and I was so clueless. So I was just like a teenager, I was an idiot. And um, I took her, I, I gave her, it's so like actually I think my first date ever. And I was just a, compl- I was just such a moron when it came to, to girls. And uh, I gave her, it was like going way overboard for a first date. You know, but I knew she'd say yes because she was a big fan. And I went, I didn't have a car. I didn't even have a car back then. So we, t- we had to take the bus and like, I don't remember how we got there. But, um, but I remember like I ruined it on the way there. Because I just had in my head, I, I had no clue how to talk to girls. I just thought like, oh, they like, I, you know, I think they like poetry, right? So I told her, I lied to her. I said, I wrote you a poem. And it was nothing. I know, I know. It's like I. Where'd you, get the, where'd you get the poem from, Sean? I, I've I've puked about this. I've I've like killed myself over this. I've like beat myself up. Um, it had nothing. The poem had nothing to do with her. I was going through. I I was thinking of myself like almost like uh, tortured. It was, it, was, it was just such a all around. Any way you look at it, it was just douchey, and just like painful, like cringy. The whole thing. So it was just like, I, was, I thought I was like this dark, tortured artist. So I wrote this horrible, gothy po- poem. Had nothing to do with her. And it had like, and she's like, well, read it to me. You know, I want to know what you wrote. And uh, I started reading. I'm like, oh, fuck, what am I doing? Like, why <laughs> are I reading it to her? She's going she's gonna to think I'm, you know, she's, she's going to think I'm, I'm out of my mind. And um, I just remember it had like dark lines, like uh, something like... Um, it was a lot about death and dying and it was like death and like uh, something betrayed by inspiration and compassed by, it was like so dark. And she's like, that's about me. Like you're talking about death and, 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 and like grieving and pain. And what is this? And I was like, you just hear her pussy drying up while she read, while she's oh, hearing beyond, her. beyond, beyond. <laughs> you, you, could, you could just, I could, I could feel everything. I feel like there's, I, I was destroying my chances. I think, like I was this in the is, middle of digging myself a hole that I could not stop. You know, this was dark, deep Alan. This is when you were Alan. Were you Alan Finn at that time? Um, I didn't still- suggest like when we went from Fuchs to Finn. My family, I was Fuchs for about sixteen years. Like uh, around that time, my family changed it to Finn, and I think just when I like turned to Finn. Right. So you were like the depressed poet guy. 
oh yeah, yeah, I thought I was like the press poet. And she was just so disturbed by it that she's like, I, I didn't even want to go to the concert, but I guess we're already on the way. We're like too close. Well, how was the concert? And it was so distracting because the whole time thing like, oh my God, I paid for these tickets. I thought for sure we'd hook up, something would happen. And I can't, like, can I salvage this? What can I do? And it was, you know, it was like I was having an emotional breakdown set to really good music. It would have been great. It would have been great like, if they started playing Wish You Were Here and she just bailed and took the fucking train. I think she actually left early. That would be ironic. I think she actually did leave think? early. <laughs> <laughs> I like how that was like. My first dates, no one taught me about how to do, you know, how to like hook up with, you know, hook up and how to just be cool. And, you know, so I just messed it up big time. So every did time I had a long, black, a long black trench coat with your crow t-shirt while you were reading the poem too. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad it, it was like like uh what, what's that like what's that goth store uh um, topic yeah it was like it was like that it was like oh. it, it's just bad it was just all around bad i like how that's your number five concert like well, it's, that's it's, it's a depressed bad because, memory that's a test from them because even though like it was a huge fuck up I still saw it. Oh, wow. Look at that, like, giant pig flying in the air. And, you know. I can imagine what number one's going to be. Yeah, I brought my dog to Jones Beach, and the dog died right in the middle of the set. And I just and drowned there. in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> it's when they had great shocks. Great what did you turn around. Pick, Jeffrey? My pick is, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go all the way back. Uh, I'm going to do uh, the Queen Jazz slash Live Killers Tour at Madison Square Garden way back at the uh, end of the 70s, I was just a, a kid and it was in, it's an insane set list. I went back and looked at up some of these set lists and, you know, they open up with uh, the fast version of We Will Rock You into Let Me Entertain You into Someone to Love. I mean, it's such a, it's queen at their height as they're ascending. Um, other songs on the set list included um, Death on Two Legs, Kill a Queen, uh, Bicycle Race. Um, I mean, I remember vividly um, uh, Freddie sitting by the piano, uh, starting uh, the opening chords of uh, Spread Your Wings, which is to me my top three all time Queen songs could be my top 10 songs of all time. Uh, your Best Friend, then they did like a three, uh, song acoustic set highlighted by um, uh, Brian doing 39. And then, of course, the famous thing from that tour was them doing fat bottom girls and the girls would come out on bicycles, you know, uh, basically wearing thongs riding around the stage. I mean, it was just it was just absolutely amazing. It was great seeing Queen at their height because I had seen them a couple of years later on the Hot Space tour, which was a complete disappointment. It was, it was the exact opposite of this. It was a bad set list. Uh, it, it was Queen just kind of going through the motions. You, you know, you could see there was some problems with the band. But this, this was Queen still, you know, there, but about to hit another level. So that's going to be uh, my number five pick, Queen Jazz great Talk. Pick. It's a great pick. I All right, my, let's go my back next to one. one. I think for my next one... Um, I'm going, it was fairly recent too. I would say it's about four years ago. Uh, you know, my favorite band, I have two favorite bands. We're going to talk about both of them tonight, but one of them is Guns N' Roses. And I never got to see them perform as a child because again, I was a little younger when like Appetite came out. And when the Illusion Tour came out, I was like old enough to go to a show, but like I wouldn't need my mom to drive me. So I never was able to go. Uh, so when they started doing the uh, Not In This Lifetime Tour, I decided that uh, I'm going to bring a friend of mine and we're going to Philadelphia for the first show because I didn't want to be around anybody uh, that I knew watch me potentially cry like a fat baby seeing them. Uh, and needless to say, the uh, stage is a huge setup. The lights go out and the first song they play is it's so easy. So all I'm hearing is mm. the dun, 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 and then I'm bawling. I'm I'm literally convulsing, crying, watching my I favorite. I get people who cry at concerts. I it was a moment. It was just a moment. Like I, again, there's certain bands that affect you in a certain way. If it wasn't for Guns N' Roses, I would have never wanted to start a band. If I didn't start a band, I wouldn't be a comedian. If I wasn't a comedian, I wouldn't be doing this fucking podcast with you every week. So. It's one of those full circle moments, you know, but they were amazing. I wound up seeing them six more times on that tour. 
uh, three at Giant Stadium, one at the Garden, one at Prudential. I mean, it was all over the place. Uh, they didn't miss a beat during that whole tour. They sounded phenomenal. Uh, even though it's not the full original lineup, the lineup they have is killer. And the uh, other musicians that are not of the original three are top notch. They're absolutely top notch musicians. Uh, one thing I didn't like about the show going forward. You saw them with uh, Slash, right? So it's Axel Slash and Duff and uh, Dizzy Reed okay. from the original. And they okay. got Richard, we got Richard Fortis and Frank Ferrer, uh, who's an amazing drummer. And uh, Frank actually played drums on our uh, previous guest, Madison Hatter's uh, new single. So we got to throw that in there too. Uh, but yeah, they were just killer. And again, they're, they're doing, they have an opening band. They're still doing a three, a three, three and a half hour set. So it's a long night when you see them. But the thing I didn't, the only thing I didn't like about the tour, it was right when Chris Cornell died and right when Glenn Campbell died. So one of my favorite songs from him is Out to Get Me. I think it's the quintessential Guns N' Roses song for me personally. And they took it out to do Wichita Lineman by Glenn that's Campbell. A great, that's a great song. But it's not a Guns N' Roses song. Jesus Christ. Oh, neither is Live and Let Die, but they kill they it. They do that. That's fine. That's their cover. But, I mean, and they took out uh, You Could Be Mine, which is a, a killer, oh, killer dude, song. That would bother me. That's my Black favorite Black Hole song. Sun by, by, mm. by Soundgarden, which was good. But again, and then later on, they actually started adding Velvet Revolver songs into the uh, set list, too, which I thought was really cool. That, that's a good concert. I'm going yeah. to see them in August. All right. Alan Fuchs, what, what is your number number uh, four kinds? Of, hopefully, it'll be a little bit more uh, uplifting than your number five. I like Jeff. Jeff can't can't fathom crying at a concert. Uh, try spending two hundred bucks for tickets and have yeah. the girl leave before the show ends. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you're, I've never when you're cried. Broke. I've never got. Yeah, I've never gotten emotional. Ne- never dur- during concert. So, what's your number four, Alan? So, uh, by the way, really quick, Sean. So, what do you think of Guns N' Roses now compared to when you saw them? They're like their peak. Um, I, I think they sound great. I'm interested to see the next album because they are working on new stuff. So yeah. that's what I'm really interested to see how what kind of fire they're going to bring to it. But I think they're older. Axel sounds great. He really does. He went through a, a very long period where his voice was shot. And if you hear, I mean, I have soundboard stuff where it sounds like it's literally a, a, a screeching weasel singing. But the uh, he, he really sounds fantastic. Slash is amazing. I mean, the rest of the band is great. But yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, you can't compare the the heyday, like the 1987 Live at the Ritz that was on MTV, where it was just pure fire and, and passion. You can't compare that to this. But uh, if you take bands from that era who are still playing now, they're the best that's going out there. Yeah. Are you going to see them in August? If I get out of work early, I am, yeah. Because that show is only about 25% sold. Really? There's there's full lower level sections that are completely available for sale. Oh, come on. Take, take a couple hours off and go. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Okay, Alan, you're up. Um, I'd say number four, it would either be... Um, these guys are always like tied in my book, like depending what mood I'm in, but I'm, I'm more of a Stones fan than a Beatles fan, mm-hmm. but I'd say a tied between the Rolling Stones and Paul McCartney. They, they okay. both, it was like, you know, it's both for like nostalgia acts. Those two, those two were just were, were killer, just amazing for their age. Also, I'm like seeing them later in their life. So I'm not seeing them like at their, at their heyday. We just but, see um, the Stones. Both, both incredible. I think both were at the garden. Mm. Wow. Very remember. Yeah. But, but the stone just seeing, you know, just, just seeing Jagger running around at that age was, was pretty amazing. Um, and they were just like good. Every single song was just, just knocking it out of the park. It was really, really incredible to watch. And Paul McCartney too. You could feel Paul McCartney was a more, it's weird with the stones that you could feel like, Oh wow. That was like very professional. Uh, when McCartney was more emotional. Hmm. You know, it's yeah. more emotional. Uh, I think I, I, I've, I've seen both and I've worked with both. And I think the Stones is a more production show. It's a more it, it, it's, a, it's a more elaborate show. Yeah. Well, well and, and they both both have great music as well. Uh, 
but I think the Stones put a lot more into the stage shows, particularly in um, back in 89 when they did uh, Steel Wheels. Uh, that was an over the top big big time show. Uh, I loved it. I and mean, that was what was great about that show was they had living color uh, open it. Stones always had great openness, but that, that this was an up and coming uh, living color. And I thought the highlight of, the, of that show was the back to back versions of um, uh, Sympathy for the Devil. There, there was literally an elevator on the stage that took Mick all the way up to, to as high as you can possibly think of. OK, on a stadium. And he, you know, he sees, you know, belting out the chorus of, you know, the who's up there uh, of uh, Symphony of the Devil, followed by my favorite Rolling Stone song of all time. Um, Give me shelter with those opening chords. It was just amazing. Um, and McCartney, I saw actually in a Broadway theater as he was uh, uh, pumping up uh, flowers in the dirt and that whole tour. But more about, you're right, you're more about the uh, production with the Stones and more about, I think, the sentimentality. You know, because yeah. he also throws a lot of uh, Beatles songs in there. That, you know, he, I, he was doing Hey Jude for like the longest time, Long and Winding Road, I remember being a highlight. So, yeah, I, I think you're right about that. So, Jeff, would you say that when, when they first came out, like when you were in high school, were they better then <laughs> or were they better when you saw them in the 80s? Well, I wasn't I was in high school. I was, I was already 47 when they both <laughs> uh, came. <laughs> I, was, I was young when they came out. But I remember being a little kid, man. My parents, I guess my, my mom must have liked the Beatles. They had a, Be- a Beatles bathrobe. All right. Oh, God. Yes. Uh, OK, so I'm going to go for my number four. And Sean, you would never think I would pick this as my number four concert. I'm like you. I've literally seen thousands of shows. And 1992 at the Beacon Theater, seeing Erasure on the uh, Tank, Swan, and Balloon tour, they were touring in support of the album Chorus, which is a great album. Um, okay. And if you're not familiar who Erasure is, it's two guys. It's Vince Clark, who started uh, Depeche Mode, and Andy Bell. And it was those two and a bunch of dances. And the way the show opened was this, this siren going off. And then Andy Bell coming out in this giant swan. And they're both, they're both gay. And it, it was, no. the, the, yes, it's, <laughs> it was, it was easily the most gay show I have ever seen in my life. Um, but it, Andy Bell has a flawless voice. He is really good. And they opened up with Siren Song, The Ship of Fools, um, the song that they played at mine and my wife's wedding, uh, Love to Hate You. And then in the middle of this of the concert, they did an opera set, which included Vous et Vous, uh, Take a Chance on Me, SOS, Lay All Your Love. And it was just like costumes and dances. And it, it was, you know, it was like, there was a giant hot air balloon that, that took Andy away at the end of the concert. And, you know, it was just like an insane Broadway play production. Um, in order to do this type of show, they had to do uh, multiple nights. I believe it was a 10 show run at the Beacon. Uh, wow. you know, be, because it was, because, yeah, because it was so elaborate. And uh, maybe aside from a band, you know, I, I, you know, they a band duo like the Pet Shop Boys, who did something kind of somewhat similar, but not as grandiose as uh, Erasure. Um, I've never seen anything like that with you know with uh, in, within a concert. It, it felt more like a Broadway production than than a concert. But it, the set list was great. The show was great. The energy was great. I saw them a couple of times on that tour. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Erasure at the Beacon Theater in 1992. That's different. I mean, I mean they're they're one of those underrated bands, though. Like, if you listen to like pop music in the 80s and early 90s, you heard like a dozen Erasure songs. And you may not ever have known that, that was actually the band that was doing them, too. Right. I mean, like they had a big hit with uh, A Little Respect. Sometimes was a big uh, hit in the uh, in the club. All the more. Uh, all the more was great. Yeah, I'm surprised yeah. you know that, man. I, yeah. you know, I, I, I didn't think you would like it, knew that. Music. I like all that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm very diverse, oh, cool. Jeffrey. I'm very diverse. I mean, you are diverse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if my next one is going to show you my diversity. Uh, not really at all. Um, <laughs> I think in the 90s and 2000s, one of the biggest things that was in rock and metal was Ozfest. Uh, I'm sure you went to a few of them too. And it was kind of hard to, they were like all day festivals. Uh, Alan, did you ever go to one? 
To Ozfest? I've never uh no, I've never been to Ozfest. I went to um well, was something with, uh, it was like a, a punk one. Oh with uh, uh, Blink 182, like Van uh, Van 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 Murphy. The Warp Tour. That's what yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. These I'm festivals Alan, are surprised great. you didn't go to Lilith Fair. <laughs> Leave him alone. He has listen, real man I, I probably would have listen. I think I'd get like a hot like hippie chick at Little Affair. I think I, I think you'd get laid at Little Affair. I I, I wouldn't put down Little Affair. I think you get like a nice sensitive girl there. And, yeah, let's play know, a game learn. who has longer leg hair. Yeah, I think you're gonna get get a lot of hostile lesbians there. That's what I think. Oh you're god, yeah. you get that too, but you might get someone who you know you probably you're get very like optimistic. Could be open to threesomes and whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Let's hear about this uh, Ozfest. Yeah. So I picked um, one of the first ones, Ozfest '97. Mm. Uh, it was at Giant Stadium. It was brutally hot that day. I uh, I was also in that mode that Alan was in, kind of for uh, the Pink Floyd show. I had my black nail polish on that day. <laughs> I was very goffed out. Uh, very ridiculous. But the lineup on this show Did was you ever have long hair, long ish, never long, like up to here and i would think it was like i was like fucking fabio that's, that's how long i thought my hair was <clears throat> but uh you know some of the like the you know smaller bands who were still big were like fear factory power man 5000 typo negative mm. but when you look at the four headliners it was pantera marilyn manson black sabbath and then ozzy doing Jesus double duty Christ. Yeah, he did double wow. duty. So he did a Sabbath wow. set, and then he did an Anazi set as well. Uh, a couple of things I remember vividly from uh, the show is in the section next to us, there was a girl who was definitely tripping on something uh, when Marilyn, and we were in like the f- as far away from the stage on the first level as you could possibly get a giant stadium. And she was trying to reach Marilyn Manson. Like she was literally holding her hands out, trying to reach him. And her boyfriend just decided to pull her skirt up and was railing her from behind right in the open. And like, it was so, we were so close. You could actually like hear the all the time. Where was this? Giant stadium. Oh, giant stadium. The old giant stadium. And then the the other thing that I remember vividly was a guy trying to jump onto the field from the second level. I should have let him. They, oh, he went (laughs) and he shattered his leg as soon as he jumped over lands on the rail you can hear the leg snap he but the the state police lost complete control of this show people were jumping over from the first level onto the field and they basically just walked off because they're not going to ruin their lives you know for a stupid marilyn manson concert but uh amazing lineup uh they've had some good ones from then too uh you know from after that one for me that's the one that stands out so when Ozzy went on, he just did Blizzard of Oz stuff, right? No, it was 97, so he did a ton of solo stuff. No, no, no. I mean, he did, he, I, I called the band Blizzard of Oz, you know. It, but, I mean, but he just, he, he guess he does does Sabbath, Sabbath. And then yeah, comes he did out Sabbath and just, with, does, with, with Sabbath, and he came out and did his Ozzy solo stuff. What a, what a catalog on this guy, right? You know, I mean, he's able to do two sets Right. And, and and we're not talking like shit sets. We're talking like deep stuff with. with oh, that. sure. And you got to take consideration too. in 97. He was still sounding somewhat decent. Sure. Because other other wow. aspects we've seen, I've seen him on. He was just I've walked out. That's how bad he sounded on some of them. Because usually he just does either a set with Sabbath or he does a solo set. Who was right. playing in his band? Who's who's a guitar player? Oh, Zach was playing for him at that time. Well, he's, he's had a bunch of great guitar players. Yeah, he's an amazing know? guitar players. The only thing was uh, Bill Ward wasn't playing drums for Sabbath during that tour. No, but it was, who was it? Vinny Apice? They had Apice playing for them at that point. Yeah, very nice. Killer show, uh, killer, you know, series of of concerts. I mean, I've seen everybody from you know System of a Down to Iron Maiden to Priest playing on Ozfest. So they've had some amazing shows over that that twelve year run that they were doing shows. Finsky, you're Jeff, number three. Jeff and I actually saw. Uh, didn't we see? We saw Judas Priest. We saw Judas Priest and Deep Purple. And, Deep and Purple. Judas Priest, yeah, I think Judas Priest absolutely blew him away. Yeah, Judas Judas Priest, 
Rob Halford, which Jeff, I don't know if you know this, he's, he's gay. No, um, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, I, I remember like he took like so many breaks while they were pl- like playing. Like he just would have to leave. He's like so old. He'd have to leave the stage and take a few minutes. So like, I remember just like the people really, was older. Yeah. But like the guy he never like, the guy, is on him. The guy stayed, but I just remember like Halford had to, like, he was constantly leaving the stage. I don't know if he was like going to like use the bathroom or like an oxygen tank or what. It was just like, oh, you take another break in the middle of the song, you know, just like nonstop. And he was like leaning over. It was still great. He was amazing. It was really cool to see that even at that age, he was doing it. But it felt, I think, wasn't he like leaning over to look at the screens for the lyrics? I don't know if he was doing that or just maybe it was a win thing, but I yeah. was very curious to see. You know, I'm glad they, they did a painkiller and it's yeah. one of my, it's a such an aggressive, great song. Oh my, and I'm glad, my and then, them too. Yeah. And, and they did it and he sang it great. And cause if he didn't, I would have been really disappointed Alan. So yeah. I, and to sing those songs at his age and hit those notes. And and still like, go, it's still going high. He's going high and he's still like rocking hard. Like it's weird seeing like a senior citizen like that doing heavy metal, you know? Well, he's the metal god. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, was ama- it was amazing to see. Like it was, it was very cool. Um, I'd say probably, um, uh, this is tough, like either Up in Smoke tour with, uh, with Dre, uh, Snoop and uh, Eminem or Nine Inch Nails when they toured with Marilyn Manson. Those are kind of tied for me too, but both yeah. are, are good for different reasons. But um, I think maybe like I, I'd give it to Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson between the two of those. That was great. That was a great tour. That was such an amazing tour, and both those guys, you know, were really. I mean, both at the peak of their powers. Um, you know, Marilyn Manson wasn't yet disgraced <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and you know basically canceled. I guess at this point. Oh yeah, um, he's not. yeah, and. Uh, and just seeing Trent Reznor, like just complete, the whole, the whole place was just with, they're one, they became one human, you know, they yeah. were so like, I've never, it's rare that you see a crowd and a singer just completely become a single organism. But that, that's what I was like. It was pretty, pretty amazing to see. One of our, uh, and a great album. I mean, so many great, you know, pretty hate machine. So many That's amazing great. songs on there, and downward spiral. And you just get to see all the all you know right there. Ninety nine percent of his ninety percent of his best music. I'm saying uh, one of our listeners agreed with you, uh, Alan. Uh, Jesse Gambino said uh, the Up and Smoke tour with Eminem, Snoop, and Dre. Um, well, uh, every one of them was fucking off the chain. Yeah, yeah. The Would you agree was- with that? They were <laughs> off the chain. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds so old and white when you say that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I pull it off. I think I think I you know it's well, very the bandana helps. For me. The bandana helps. The bandana helps. Well, listen, the bandana makes me young. Uh okay. very young. Um and um Vicky Plummer uh, agreed with you, Sean. She was also at the uh, Foo Fighters and thought it was uh, absolutely amazing. She was moved. She said the whole arena was rocking out and uh, people had tears stream- streaming down their face. It was so incredibly powerful. It really Did was. Did Chappelle do any jokes? What's that? Did Chappelle do any jokes or he just sang that song? No, he just sang Creed in the middle of the set. You know, it was weird. My friend, I, I got my tickets from my friend and I, I gave my other friend my tickets. So... Is that how you got better seats? I did get better seats. God fucking Sean. He is, he is, he is you know, listen, you got to go to a concert with Sean. He, he finds a way. I he always find a way. A- <laughs> so my friend texted me, he goes, wow, Chappelle came out. And I go, what the hell are you talking about? Apparently he got a leak of the set list like an hour before. And he blew, he ruined it for me. Cause I didn't know Chappelle was coming out. And then like, 15 minutes later, Chappelle comes out. I was like, you dick. But uh, <laughs> he wasn't trying to sing. You know, he wasn't trying to, like, you know, be this operatic voice. He was just being Chappelle. And, like, that one high note. But, they, you know, he didn't mm-hmm. even attend. He's like, she. And, like, the place took it over, you know, obviously. But yeah. it was fun to see. I mean, I would have liked to see somebody else. But, yeah, it was fun to see. That's what Tears for Fears covered that song on that last tour. I've actually seen Radiohead in concert doing that song. Did you really? like him? 
Yeah, yeah. It was like uh, before. Did you go with Jeff Lawrence? No. <laughs> no. That's a favorite band. <laughs> You're lucky you saw them do creeps. They don't do it anymore. They don't do it no, anymore. Right? No. This is like early on in their career. Why would you do your, your best band? known song? Because that's what that's what douchebag musicians do. <laughs> They're like, no, you know, I'm going to play the 17 uh, minute opus instead of the one song that made us a fucking band. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, they, I think a lot. I think maybe some of that. Like, it is douchey. You go to see someone, you know, you want them to play the hits, you know, and they don't. The um, hits. But I think also they may have a thing because they were compared to Nirvana. There, during that time, you know, mm. and that song was like, they were like, oh, you're trying to be Nirvana with that song. So I don't know. Maybe it got like, they, they went in such an artsier direction. They're like annoyed by mainstream fans. So it, it's like, I don't know. I got, it, it, it is pretentious for them not to play that. Oh, big time. Sean brought up a good point on something before. Do you want to know the set list before you go to the concert? Do you want to be per, uh, totally surprised? It depends on the band. You know, yeah. I, some like speaking of like art, that's a good topic. Like artists who refuse to play their hits and the reason is like people, especially artists, like they don't have a, a newer hit album and people haven't embraced their, I remember like I went to see John Mellencamp, right? And uh, when? I'm not, like, recently? Like, eight, no, oh, okay. ages ago, like, okay. over 10 years ago. Um, and he, uh, he, he made a really fatal mistake. He went to the audience and he's like, all right, guys, do you want to hear our old songs, the hits you've heard a million times. It's just, you know, boring already. You just, you're just sick of it. You're hearing it on the yeah, radio. You, you don't want to hear Jack and Diane, uh, you know, the song that made me. Or, right. Yeah, right. You don't <laughs> want to hear that or Scarecrow. Or so he's sitting on off the lows and Jubilee. Yeah, yeah. He's like trying to like sway the audience, right? And he's like, you want to hear the songs? You just, you know, you're surprised. You're sick of hearing. You hear them all the time. Or do you want to hear our new stuff that we're really excited about? That we can't wait to play for you. And they're yeah, like, you experimental old album. Stuff, old stuff. <laughs> and he great. was so pissed. It was like weird. Like, like <laughs> that he couldn't see in the future. And he, he had no foresight. Of course, they're not going to want to hear you do shit. You know? I, you can, I, don't, I don't like to look at a set list. I, I mean, like for a band like the Foo Fighters, I know they're going to play My Hero, Everlong, Breakout, yeah. Learn to Fly. They, they're close with uh, Everlong, right? They always close with Everlong. I saw them open yeah. with it one time. I was convinced they were going to open with it the last show. But like, there's certain bands that like I will check out their set list. Like, I'm, I'm a big fan of this band called Clutch, oh, and Clutch, they're right? known for never playing the same set list twice. So I will check out the night before set list to see if it's like a really good one, because then I know I'm gonna get fucked on the show that I go to. <laughs> you know, I did the same thing. <laughs> you know, like I saw them one time in Philadelphia, and like they have one album that I'm not a fan of, and I don't know, don't know why it just doesn't click with me. It's called The Elephant Riders. So I'm like, all right, you know. So I, I get to the Trocadero. It's a great theater, and the lights go out, and they put the spotlight on, and then they drop the banner from behind the drum kit, and it's the fucking Elephant Riders logo, and the place goes ballistic, and they play that damn album from beginning to end. I was salty. That sucks. Oh. I was sold. That, I'm a big uh, Morrissey fan. I was a big um, Smith fan. I, I would go see Morrissey every time he'd come. And I would, I would always look because I, would, I was like you. I was like, I know I'm going to get fucked out of my good song. He's he's not going to play any Smith songs. He's going to play some obscure shit, you know. Um, but <laughs> I, I've, I've been lucky. All right. So here's, um, here's my number three. Uh, I'm also going back on this one. Uh, this is a great one. Uh, and I have to... Ha- include the opening act it was black sabbath black sabbath with the opening act van halen the great uh, work. um i'm gonna give you van halen's uh they only did six songs as their opener these yeah these are the songs in no particular order um you really got me running with the devil eruption ain't talking about love jamie's crying ice cream man so you're looking and at that's like, what, what, 77 78 that came out that was yeah that's uh 78 Wow. That was wow. the summer of 78. Oh. Uh, yeah, I got it down. So that's still David Lee Roth. Oh, God, yeah. It's first album. Yeah, that's 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 as that's, as the first album is being released. They're, they're, they're touring in support of Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath is on the verge of breaking up because Ozzy can't get it together. This is And Sabbath is uh, touring in support of, um, I think it was Technical Ecstasy. Probably. That was the album. Um, and they, uh, they, I mean, they opened up themselves like 
it was sick. Uh, they opened up with a uh, symptom of the universe, which is probably in my top five Sabbath songs into war pigs, into snow blind, into never say die. I love the f- every song. It was, it was a short set list. They only did like 16 songs, but they closed with paranoid. They did children of the gr- grave. I mean, Sabbath is always great when you see him. And even I used to go see every incarnation of Sabbath. I saw them countless times with Dio. Dio was amazing. I saw him, saw him with Gillen. You know, Gillen was was really cool. They were heavy, really heavy you know, on that when I'm, I'm born, uh, born again. Um, but this uh, this tour here, this show here, I mean, again, I'm a little kid, you know, but it ju- it always stayed with me. It, you know, this is what made me like love, love Sabbath and is my my one A, one B favorite band. That's a great tour, though. I mean, no matter what, you know, I would have I would have definitely went to that, but I was too. Um, yeah. So then my next show that I saw, Jeff, you may remember this show, actually. Uh, it was in November. November 28th, 2001, to be exact. Uh, it was right after 9-11. So, you know, New York was basically shut down. People were still going through all this stuff. And they did a show called New York Steel at Hammerstein Ballroom. where they basically took New York and New Jersey acts and they did this mega concert. So it was Ace Freely, Overkill, Anthrax, Sebastian Bach, and Twisted Sister headlined. Wow. Eddie Trunk put the show together. Uh, it was also during that point, like right after 9 11, where they had that big anthrax scare. People were getting the envelopes sent to. Yeah, yeah. I remember NBC used to get. They right. were getting all these things. So, anthrax, the band, came out with white suits, like these uh, hazmat suits. And they were claiming that they were going to change their name to Basket Full of Puppies. <laughs> right. And then they all turned around and it, said, and it spelled out, We're not changing our name. The only thing I remember that was really weird about the show, uh, Ace Freely uh, was about to go on to playing the intro music, and then he was sound asleep against his Marshall stack, and someone pushed him from behind, and he ran out and just went right into New York Groove. Yeah, he was was back in those days. But, uh, you know, I only put that on here because I didn't want to put another Foo Fighters concert on again because it was one that was – I had two on my list. Uh, That was a great show because it was kind of like bringing back – life to new york city and all the money was donated to like the first responders fund for the firemen for the cops and stuff like that uh, i remember they did a big concert like that at madison square garden and i was also yeah tribute to, yeah tribute to heroes yeah. a great yeah. great show i, I had I on turn those day. tickets down oh that's that's smart did, did you go see fucking air supply that day instead <laughs> no i didn't go see air supply that day Jesus. No. You know, let's put let's put Springsteen, Billy Joel, Paul McCartney, Stevie Wonder, everybody in the world on this freaking show. But you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go see fucking air supply instead. Um now the other show I was gonna suggest that was a toss-up between this was uh five years ago on July 4th at RFK Stadium in DC. Uh it was the Foo Fighters with Hart, Gary Clark Jr., LL Cool J, Trouble Funk, Cheap Trick. Uh, and some other another band as well. What time did the show start? At ten in the morning? Uh, like three in the afternoon. But it was cool because they only did two types of tickets. It was general admission floor and general admission seating. So Where, wherever you want to sit, you could sit. Where did Cheap Trick go on in the set? In the middle. In the middle. <laughs> Heart was direct opening, I believe, for uh, for Foo Fighters. But it was kind of cool. It was a it was like a three hour thunderstorm and lightning storm delay. It was just, it was completely, that's completely. A, that's, a gr- that's a great lineup. Oh, it was amazing. And it was like, you know, that they ended the whole show with like a gigantic fireworks display it while they're playing ever long at the end. It was just a great moment. You know that why was, they do a big fireworks display at the end of the show, right? It was July 4th, dopey. Well, a lot of bands, I mean, the Stones did this all the time too. No. That would give them enough, that would give them enough time to get out of the stadium while everyone's sitting oh. there watching the fireworks. There, that, that there you sense, go, actually. right from the stage into the vans and they're gone. So by the time people are trying to get out, they've already left. That's, that's actually a smart move. And that's your Pantera. And you stay into, in, in the stadium until four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And, and make about $12,000 worth of damage. Yeah. That was yeah. a good one. All right. Uh, Alan. Um, all right. Number so three. what number are we up to now? There were, uh, four. Uh, no, yeah. There's a, we, we, you have one more after this. All right. So um, I would say I saw actually got to see Nirvana 
um, before I was a Nirvana fan. I was too young to really know what was going on and to really appreciate them the way. I did. And then, I, of course, you know, I became a huge fan afterwards. Um, so I couldn't appreciate them in the moment. But um, I saw Nirvana in the, um, the early 90s. I think it was for their In Utero tour. Okay. And, at uh, Roseland. Yeah, at Roseland. I was there. Um, yeah, and it was, it was amazing. I, I snuck into that show. You did? Yeah, that's, really? that's, that's John famous. Uh, I snuck into stuck, that There's a couple of famous uh, incidents at Tours. That's yeah. one of them. And I remember, like, towards the end, they were, like, getting, like, really, they were doing, like, a lot of feedback and screechiness with their guitars. And a lot of people are just walking out. They're like, what, what is this? You know? And um, I just remember like, damn, I wish I was like a huge fan when I saw, you ever have that moment where you become a huge fan later and you're like, ah, oh, yeah. damn it. I when, when, when Van oh, Halen like, opened up the Sabbath, that's what made me a Van Halen fan. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's a, so, there's a couple, there's a couple of bands that like I saw Shinedown open up for Seether at a really small club down the block from my house called Starland Ballroom. So it holds about 2000 people. And it was right before like their Sound of Madness album came out, which is like their big breakout album. But they were so phenomenal that like the place was insane. It was insane for this band. And they were just, they were so good. And Seether comes on and does like a slow song, like a real broody, I'm too cool for the room. I'm going to write this girl a poem kind of song. And, uh, (laughs) They started with a second one and then a third one. And then they walked three quarters of the place. They could not follow this band. And that's when I became a fan of Shine Down too that night because I saw them in this really tiny little place before they really blew up. Yeah, so, so that's why I think sometimes, you know, who the opening or support acts on these shows are uh, is so important. You know, it, re- oh, it yeah. really could, it really could like, like turn you and, and make you a fan. Sure. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go with my next one. Um, back in 1987, the David Bowie Glass Spider Tour. Uh, talking about great support acts, Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam, Squeeze. Uh, this was at the old Giant Stadium. And Bowie was touring in support of uh, the Never Let Me Down album, which is a great album. Um, Peter Frampton was the uh, guitar player and, and band leader uh, on this tour. It was very theatrical. Um, this, when Bowie comes out, there is a giant, giant spider. Okay. On the stage, you know, it, it, it it's, just, it's just, it's all lights and everything. And he comes down again, like uh, on some type of hydraulic, which is dropping him. And it's a, he, there's a poem which starts off the album, which is recited uh, before he goes into, um, uh, you know, the, the song Glass Spider, you know, Spider, whatever it's called. Um, but it was it was such a great set list as well. It, it was in support of an album, which he did a, a lot of the album really good. But he also had the hits of China Girl Out, Fashion, Young Americans, uh, Let's Dance, Fame. He closes with Modern Love. Um, it really was a phenomenal stage show. You're seeing Bowie in the eighties as you know, where he's like in shape and he's, you know, he's cool. And, you know, in support of this, you know, great new album. Um, it really was, it really was a, a highlight. It was a great, great show. And I had seen Bowie years later on in, um, he did something called the New York marathon where he did a show every night in a different borough. And I was lucky enough to work the show in Staten Island. He did it uh, Snug Harbor, uh, maybe wow. in a room that maybe fits a thousand people, sure. maybe that much. Just really unbelievable. And, you know, great set list. But I mean, this was spectacular. And this was turned into a, um, a DVD. They That's made great. A movie about this. So, yeah, that, that, if you ever get a chance, people, you know, if you ever get a chance, check out the highlights of uh, the David Bowie Glass Spider Tour from 1987. Yeah, see, seeing like a big act like that in a small room, like a thousand seater or something like that, that that's that that's an incredible. I that I'll talk about that later because it's not my turn. But like, but I've seen bands like that, like Depeche Mode in a small in a Where small. Did you see Depeche room. Mode in a small place because they're oh, one of my like, favorite bands. It, it was it was like um, about ten years ago. It was a small venue. I just remember it was like a really small venue. It wasn't like a arena. It was almost like. Um, Almost like a like a Roseanne ballroom type place. 
because, because they always play like Madison Square Garden when they come around. Um, before we before we go on to our last picks, I just want to read some of the uh, other uh, uh, contributions that people uh, sent to us on Facebook. Uh, Joseph Peter wrote Brian Wilson doing pet sounds at Jones Beach. Um, I saw that show in at Radio City. That was great. Um, K KP Burke, friend of ours. Um, not the best, but the most bizarre was Smashing Pumpkins at PNC a few years back. Mark McGrath came out and sang Jews Priest. Yep. Then, uh, then Billy and the Pumpkins played I Just Want to Fly. I was you know that, that one? Show. Sure. I was at that show. Yeah, it was very what, strange. What priest song did he do? Uh, I think. Oh, Breaking the Law. Break, he said. Yeah, Breaking the Law. Very strange. Uh, uh, yeah. Ugh. Uh, and he said, um, oh, uh, Courtney Love also came out at the end and did Celebrity Skin. Wow. That is really, well, really, really wrote good. that album for her, too. Mm. OK. Uh, Scott Brennan, Chili Peppers and Foo Fighters was a pretty great show. And he, that was together. Wow. Do you, do you remember that, Sean? Uh, I do remember that. It, it, it's funny because like my, you know, we were just talking about the uh, the difference in seeing a, a big act in a small place. My last pick is actually that. Uh, then hold then hold off on that because I want to we want to get more into that. Um, and also Vincent James, you know Vinnie James, right, Alan? Yeah, 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 good dude. Um, he said one of the best shows he ever saw was Allison Chains and Velvet Revolver. Yeah, that was a great tour. Uh, that's a you saw that one? Yeah, that's a really really great great show. And of course, Davin Rosenblatt, a, a, a <laughs> A former guest on this show, past guest on the show, Kiss Reunion Tour 1996 at, at MSG with Run DMC, Kid Rock, and Aerosmith. And they all came out and did Walk This Way. Amazing. That's great. Um, Aerosmith, he went to go see Aerosmith in Vegas doing the residency. And then did you ever hear something called uh, Slam Glam Metal Jam with Enough yeah. Enough, Quiet Riot, uh, Warrant, and Poison? I would have loved to see that. That was one of the first like metal uh, 80s metal tours that came out like in the mid-90s after they were all kind of washed up. Ten years later, they're already watched. Yeah, basically, up. yes, grunge killed the, the metal. Okay, so let's get into our our last uh, round of, um, of of concerts, and just just want to thank everybody who who sent in uh, suggestions on, on concerts they saw. Go ahead, John. So I got the opportunity to work out at the Laugh Factory in Las Vegas. Uh, I got booked for a weekend out there, and then I also managed to score tickets to see Lady Gaga at the Park Theater, at the Park MGM, which is it's a 5,000 seat theater. And the thing about the theater, the way it's set up is no matter where you sit, the furthest away from the stage you'll be is 131 feet, just because of the way that it, it's laid out with the seats. So she did one show, full Gaga, you know, full Gaga performance. And then the second show was the jazz piano uh, is this the Monsters it, Ball uh, tour? No, no, this, tour? this is the residency she did in in Vegas. Mm. That's okay. they're still going on, but obviously it's a kind of on hold. But I managed to score tickets for both shows, so I saw her two days two days in a row. Uh, just uh, she's one of the greatest performers that's alive right now, and to see her, I mean, I've seen her at MSG and she was fantastic, but to see her in a little theater. Uh, it was just mind blowing how great the show was. And she did one of those uh, zip line entrances. Uh, yes. And she was literally right over my head. So I was kind of praying that her zip line would break and she would fall ass first into my head. But that didn't right happen. In your face, right? I would, I would love that for happen. But yeah. uh, no, she's, she's an amazing performer, an absolutely amazing performer. And to see her in that small venue, she brought out like Tony Bennett. Uh, Bradley Cooper to do the shallow song. Right, it was right after the Star Is Born came out. Hate that song. It's a good song. It's a good song. It's no. like the it's like the song that every like soccer mom sings in the car. Uh -huh. which is, that's what, it. That's she's, it. That she's wishing that's her life was it. completely different, and she's thinking about her old boyfriend from high school who had a huge hog, and she's married to an insurance guy with like a two inch micro penis, and she's just like <laughs> sitting there thinking away where her life really is. Every woman sings that song, but uh, no, it was it was an amazing concert. I just made that movie even sadder. <laughs> yeah, right. I had yeah. gotten uh, uh, 
uh, invited to the premiere of that movie. So I got to see it before it came out. And of course, the scene where Bradley kills himself, you could have heard a fucking pin drop in that th- in that theater. And then you hear me go, get the fuck out of here, <laughs> really loud in front of everybody. A lot of people turn their head in disgust at yeah. me. But uh, my original my original pick was I didn't put it on here because I know you guys don't really know who this band is. It is my favorite band. They're called Life of Agony. They broke up in 1997. They were away for six years. They decided to do a reunion show at Irving Plaza. To this day, I still have never seen a show more electric. It was one of those shows where the energy in the room was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And they taped both shows for, uh, you know, for a DVD. And that's almost that's 18 years ago. And now they're still they're still together. Their singer uh, transitioned from Keith to Mina. He's very she's very happy now. And she's uh, Chris Johnson just told that story the other night. What's that? Uh, we, were, we were talking about band members <laughs> that have transitioned because the keyboard player in Jethro Tull mm-hmm. um, at the age of like 61 transitioned. Wow. And then he brought up the life of agony singer. Yeah. And they're better. They're better now than they were. They're better now than they were. So. So let me ask you guys this question. OK, before we go on with this, if you had the chance just for the story, just for the story, would you or would you not Caitlyn Jenner? Just for the story. Um, I, I think so. Yeah. I, see, I, like, I like that honesty. Yeah, I would. I mean. First of all, when are you ever going to fuck an Olympic athlete? I mean, don't worry about the hog. Don't put the hog aside. There's no hog anymore. There's no hog. All right. So put put this sure? Arby's roast beef sandwich away. No I'm, I'm, po- I'm positive. I've done a lot of research on this topic, Alan. I'm positive. The yes. hog has been removed. Jeffrey's Google search does show a lot of transsexual porn. <laughs> what, he's, what he's basically saying. So you know, I would definitely do that. Who who, who wouldn't want to say, yeah, I, I banged a, a person who was on a Wheaties box. Alan? I mean, there are hotter people in that family. And, but, but it's Caitlyn <laughs> Jenner. And, and, and it's not like they're lining up the, the, you know, for you, Alan. It's Caitlyn Jenner. You have the opportunity. You know, Caitlyn Jenner comes to, comes to, to one of your shows. You know, you're, you're at the stand one night, and she's she's in the audience. She goes, "You know what? I I, I like that uh, uh, magician looking guy. You know, he's a very interesting that Elon Musk looking guy. He looks very, he is so attractive to me, and she wants to hook up with you for the story. Do you do it? I would do it to see if I could parlay it into hooking up with one of the Kardashians or oh, the Kardashian. Do you, like you have five, you have five girls you could pick from. Who is your least attractive of the five Kardashian girls? Easy, the one that was married to Scott Disick. Yeah, I'll probably agree with you with that. All right, so let, let's. Um, we we are nearing the end of this show, so let's. Uh, uh, so we got we got Sean's last pick. Uh, go ahead, uh, Alan. Let's hear your last pick. Um. All right. So Jeff knows. Like this is like probably. My- my favorite band. Um, That's what I thought you were going to uh, go with. You know who I'm going to go with, right? Can you hear me? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I was going to put this on my list, but I didn't because I figured you would. Yeah. Yeah. So I've seen this band um, every tour since uh, Pop Mart. So I've seen them do Pop Mart. I've seen them do Elevation and Vertigo Tour, all, the, all those tours. Um, you know, huge production values. Um but you know, my my girlfriend took me to see them in New Orleans recently for their Songs of uh, Experience tour. But really, the best I've seen them, even though they put on the mul- the biggest multi million dollar spectacles, was at the Apollo. Wow! You two at the Apollo, the Sirius XM show, where you had all these people, you had celebrities in the audience who normally you know could be too cool for the room. They got up, they were going crazy with the fans. The walls were were like shaking, you know. The wall, like the place was was really moving, and and uh, it was the most phenomenal experience. Like containing such a massive band in such a small space was an incredible experience. That that's that's the best I've ever seen them, and they they spent like you know a hundred bucks on the background scenery. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I still don't, I think I saw them on the Bar tour at Giant Stadium as well. And they were just they're one of those bands I think everybody has to see at one point in their life. 
because they're not just, um, you know, they're one of those bands that everybody can say they like at least one song by. Like if you're a rock guy, a metal guy, a rap guy, a country guy, everybody knows you too. Well, yeah. they've changed so much when they came out as well. Yeah, it's true. You know, but, but that's fine. I mean, that's what bands do. Bands grow. Um, Alan, Sean, I was thought... We just really yeah. great. Sean, Sean is right about that. Like a lot of people, like, so if you're a metal guy, you'll probably like Octum Baby, you know? Mm-hmm. If you're um, a classic rock guy, you'll love Joshua Tree, you know? Like if you're into like Dylan and all that, you'll be like a Joshua Tree fan. So they have like all these different um, phases, phases they've gone through. And they used to be a really experimental band. You look at Zeropa and the Passengers album, um, and then, you know, just the last few albums have been a little too adult contemporary, but still great albums. So Can we all agree that that song Lemon really sucks. Yeah, I um, hate that yeah, song. Yeah, I disagree with you. I, l- I like that song. Oh, no. dude, you had me the whole episode and you're losing me in the last three uh, minutes. I disagree with you. I disagree because I, I, I'm, I'm such a geek when it comes to them. That song's about his mother. <sighs> yeah, so I know. Like, still, the whole still not a good song. song. You don't like that song Lemon, really? No, but you know what, Alan? I, I got it. I, I, that falsetto is pretty, pretty the, uh, amazing for rock, you know? The the show that we saw, uh, we saw them do the Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree, yeah. And, you know, played entirely. And that, to me, was one of the most surprising shows I've ever been to. Because the opening act, the Lumineers, were horrible. Horrible. Okay? The whole, they, they every oh, fucking song sounds the same. There, there's nothing edgy. I hate the Lumineers. Yeah, but and you know, Jeff, they have a song that's white and blue. They have a song that makes me think of you, the Lumineers. The, oh, hey, yes, it says, "I belong to you. You belong to me. You're my sweetheart." Ah. That song is fucking horrendous. And <laughs> <laughs> they, when you two on that tour, Alan, if you remember, you know the. Um, uh, who's the drummer? Larry Mullen. Larry Mullen comes up from a you know from underneath the stage and is just is playing, and they go into Sunday Bloody Sunday. Yeah, and and each as each member of the band came walking on the stage, and it was so good. And they did about four or five songs, you know, that were hits. Then they went on to remember the main stage and did the whole Joshua Tree from beginning to end, and then they came back on to the uh, smaller stage, and they and I never. Sort of stadium rock like they did when they did Elevation. That I remember, I taped it. That was so so good. Uh, that was one of them, probably the most surprising shows I've ever seen. But uh, I'm gonna wrap this up for us. And uh, my probably like my favorite show is, is a recent one, 2019. Uh, going to see my favorite band, uh, Iron Maiden, did Legacy of the Beast tour. And, and when you look at I think what makes a great concert, like how we started off the show, is it the set list? Is it the stage uh, show? Uh, is it the lineup on the show? I mean, this is, this was the most elaborate main um, stage show I've ever seen. The set list of any band I've ever seen, this was the best set list. I mean, it, it was every song I could have hoped for. They open, you know, Maiden opens up their show with a video clip of Churchill and World War II, and they go into Aces High. And it's such a great, great opening number. And all the members come running out. Um, it just gets you. And they go Aces High into where Eagles Dare into two minutes uh, to midnight. And I swear to God, I don't know if there is a better three opening songs of any band and any concert, I just, I love, love this band. And then you throw in, and they start doing some deeper cuts, like The Wicker Man. And then they did uh, a Flight of Iris, which they hadn't done in a, in a bunch of years. And they do Fear of the Dark. And then their encores, their encores are The Evil That Men Do and Hallowed Be Thy Name, which is my favorite song. Okay. Um, it doesn't get any better than that. I, I had a blast before they, even came on i was probably about six scotches in and uh, it was really really a great great time and a great show and uh they were supposed to come around again and fucking covid but that that is my um the last time i saw maiden was in 2006 when they no was it 2006 whatever they did a matter of life and death remember that album that horrible fucking concept album they did and they said in the very beginning, <laughs> we're only playing this album on the tour. And I still bought tickets. They go, ah, they're full of shit. 
And I sat through having to listen to that garbage album. And they came out and did a two song encore. They did Hallowed Be Thy Name and I think Two Minutes to Midnight. It was the only two hits. They they would run to the hills or something. No, they only did those two songs. And people were losing their minds. Were absolutely losing their minds, and they they walked off like an hour and thirty minutes for Maiden. That's nothing. They They're just going to think smaller room. That was at the Continental Arena. Oh wow! Because they, they they did tour on that, and in New York they played um, the place down uh, Hammerstein. Yeah, Hammerstein this Ball. Was, this was a, what a horrible show! But they've redeemed themselves over the years. Yeah, a couple of honorable mentions. Uh, I mean, that, that I, I guess I can't like leave out. I mean that. Uh, probably the best opening of a concert I've ever seen, well, besides Maiden, was The Cure on the uh, Kiss, uh, the Kiss, Kiss, Kiss tour. They, they had, they was, they did that album, and the opening song was called The Kiss, and it's such an intense album. Uh, the Jacksons' 1984 Victory Tour, I saw that was an amazing one. Um, I don't know if you guys like Alanis Morissette, but her and uh, Garbage toured together. And, mm-hmm. and that was also a surprisingly fantastic show. And Rush at the Palladium opening and doing the entire uh, uh, 2112 uh, album to, to start the show. Again, those are, those are some real highlights. And I'm, I'm sure we're leaving out tons of shows that we've oh, seen. God, I, can, I can do this for 17 hours and then not get tired exactly. of this. We got to wrap it up. Yes. So, um, Alan, tell us a little bit about how people can find you and how could people uh, get in touch with you? Good. Yeah, uh, Alan Fuchs, A-L-L-A-N-F-U-K-S, on Instagram, all social media, and on YouTube, it's Nightmare Fuel Media. Nightmare Fuel Media on YouTube. And Sean, you, you want to uh, talk a little bit about um, two weeks from now? Yeah. Because uh, we have people be, who, uh, who listen to us uh, from upstate. Yeah, I will be uh, headlining Laugh It Up Comedy Club in Poughkeepsie, New York, Friday, uh, sep- uh, Friday July uh, 9th and Saturday, July 10th. One show Friday, two shows Saturday with my buddy Jeffrey Paul opening up for me. <laughs> my <laughs> up for Sean. I'm looking forward to that. I'm really looking forward to that. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for, for following. Please subscribe. Uh, we are going back to Adam. Adam, right? We're going back to uh, the Be Terrific uh, site. So we ha- we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, more opportunity. We have a lot more subscribers on there. So that'll be cool. But keep subscribing. Keep uh, following us. We appreciate it. And we'll be back with a whole new show next week. Yep. Have a happy 4th of July, folks. I'll talk to you later. Take care, everybody. Later. Bye. Bye.